here we are, and hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Living Process Podcast courtesy video, courtesy of Arroyo Outdoor here, and I'm fantastically happy to be here with uh, William Fox, yeah, with the uh, guitar, with the blues guitar, and this next tune that I'm going to open with is a tune I wrote called uh, Meditation Blues, Hurtin' Blues. And again, it's like a meditation on John Hurt, right? So I call it Hurtin' Blues or Meditation Blues, and it's really a meditative uh, tune based on John Hurt's uh, early folk and kind of country blues picking uh, guitar. <laughs> Was a fantastic sound, you know, because I saw the first the first time I noticed you playing the guitar was well, a couple of weeks ago or something. Right. Yeah. And you're you're over on this. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing about the stuff around here. There's a little uh, corner in between the train tracks and one of the coffee shops where folks go and, and uh, play music. One of the things I thought was pretty great and really adds to the, the fantastic sound you got. Can you tell people about the the bottleneck? Absolutely. Yeah. So this is a bottleneck slide. It's on uh, on my pinky here and. More commonly, um, you see, I guess nowadays, you see a steel slide or, or a brass pipe or a copper kind of thing. Uh, what I'm using is a bottleneck, so just like it sounds, bottleneck, it comes from a wine bottle. And uh, I like to play it on my pinky, but there are people who play it on the ring finger, and that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful, old, very antiquated style of playing guitar. It makes an effect like what you heard, which is... Uh, sorry to disturb yeah. you guys. Uh, oh, no problem. Uh, Go David, ahead. Yes. Um, we have a small problem. Um, somehow the water has been turned off on the museum. And some of the vendors use it. There's a, a water spigot on the outside, but they don't have any access to water. Oh. Yeah. Well, we, could, we, we got a big old hose if that'll help. Very nice. All right. Okay. I'll swing thought. that around for you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll let Bardo know. He's one of the vendors here. Yeah, no problem. Thank, thank you, Dan. All right. Sure. You need a hand, David? Or? Uh, no, that's all right. You can keep going. I'm, I'm not going to edit this. 
No, um, so just uh, have fun, and uh, you know, we're still going. David, while you're pulling hose, I'm gonna I'm gonna play this next tune, which is one of my favorite tunes to play. I didn't play this uh, the last time we encountered each other, but uh, this tune is called uh, called "High Water Everywhere" by Charlie Patton, and it's a tune that's based on the 1929 Texas flood, I believe. So it goes something like this. Resolved. Yeah. Resolved. So they got the yeah, they needed a hose over there because they had a their water hookup I guess wasn't working. Well everybody heard and that. But yeah, that's all set. No, oh, look at that. <laughs> How 
many years have you been playing guitar? Uh, David, about, shoot, I picked up the guitar, I want to say about 10 years ago now, so I should be uh -huh. a lot better, but, you know, we, we get by with with a little bit of sliding around, and, you know, it, it's a lot of fun, so it's a, it's a huge, you know, relief for me in the evenings after sure. long days of work, and, you know, that kind of thing, it's, it's very, like I said, that uh, tune before last that I played that uh, hurting blues or I call it meditation blues is, is uh, it's a source of meditation almost you know to pick up the guitar and yeah. be able to just drift off somewhere else um, but yeah to answer your question it's been about it's been about uh, 10 years now That's sounding sounding pretty good to me I, I appreciate it yeah thank you nice. the uh, and then another thing another thing of course I'm curious about and um, do you Proactive and let me know about the, the water and everything. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, but you. the, uh, I've got, uh, got refreshment for myself here. And uh, the, another thing that caught my eye was the, uh, the tube amp setup. You got this new tube amp and this classic voice coil. Right, so the tube amp, um, I, I don't know much about amplifiers to be honest but this tube amp is a it's a Wang's uh, 5 mini tube amp is what I'm told it's called mm -hmm. um, and the combination uh, I don't know if you were there David when Mike showed up my friend Mike he's who actually he showed up at that event where, where I was playing where you and I met oh yeah uh, but he's the guy who who hooked me up per se with this beautiful setup it's a Wang's mini uh, it's a Wang's 5 mini tube amp is what it's called and it's set up right. to this uh, Bell and Howell classroom speaker. It's a 1940s Bell and Howell classroom speaker. So it's literally what it sounds like. It's a speaker that was used in classrooms um, in schools, I want to say around around the country, really. Um, all over the country. But it's a beautiful... It's a beautiful cabinet, and everything fits inside of it. And then, you know, it's um, it's just the aesthetic of it, also, right? It really yeah. creates a, an atmosphere of its own. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a beautiful setup. I'm glad that you you noticed it. Not too many people do it. Seems like. Well, I can see. I've um, I can I can give a shout out to some fa fantastic other people in Pasadena, folks at Audio Element. If anybody knows it, it's in uh, downtown Pasadena, and they do all kinds of audio stuff, tube amp, transistor, fantastic things. But um, I've been fascinated with kind of geeky audio stuff for many, many years, and I've come to appreciate how uh, some people might think that it's always in your imagination about tube transistors. To some extent, maybe, but when you get the right stuff hooked up to the right stuff, it does make a very big difference, and there's, um, I always describe the sound that is, especially applies to the top ends of things as smooth and liquid that tubes do, because they're not chopping up the sound. The valve amplification keeps everything real pure analog. Uh, transistors have a little bit of a soft punch to them, right? Like, uh, there's good reasons maybe if you want to record a, a kick drum on something transistor. It has an immediate punchiness. Uh, but tom drums, piano, solo piano on tubes, oh man. And then especially when, when, you're, when you're playing that slide, it, it has that real special feel to it. And then it's got, there, there's a tone. Not to drone on too much about it, but you, if you listen, if anyone has ever listened to Dick Dale's Greatest Hits on CD, have you listened to that one? I, not, not the Greatest Hits album, but I have listened to Dick Dale. Yeah, Dick Dale's, yeah. everyone knows Dick Dale, Misery Lou. The Pulp Fiction thing, the thing in Pulp Fiction was Dick Dale, but the, um, you can hear in his greatest hits that the sound that it changes, stuff that was recorded in the early 60s versus stuff that was recorded in the 70s and 80s, oh, it absolutely. just doesn't, it's like, eh. and the big difference is two things, tungsten transistors and tubes. And you know, to, to touch on that, on the acoustics and sound, you know, I, I remember hearing that, you know, Robert Johnson, who I'd say is probably one of the most famous known yeah. blues players of all time, right? Um, given the folklore and the legend that, you know, he's um, wrapped around in, let's say. So, I remember hearing that he would turn his back to the audience when he was playing in his juke joints. And a lot of people said, you know, oh, it's because, you know, they, they just add the legends to it, right? Sure. Oh, it's because he, you know, 
he had this crazy technique and he didn't want anybody to see it or you know he didn't want anyone to steal his style etc you know the list goes on um, but really I mean the best way I could put it was that someone said to me often musicians will turn towards the corner of a room to get to create a certain amplification, a natural amplification, it'll bounce off the walls, you know, and create this That's you a know, real echoing thing. kind of effect through the room that you're in. That is absolutely a real thing, you know, because the corners, uh, infamously, people who set up audio stuff call the corners bass traps, right? But but if you because if you put your speakers smack in the corners, which you might think is logical spatially, it's not going to sound the same. It's going to suck up a lot of bass. However. If you're Robert, if you're Robert Johnson, I mean, I've heard, I've heard the guy from, um, the guy from ZZ Top, the guitar, I forget his name, but yeah. the famous guitarist from ZZ Gibbons, Top, right, Billy Gibbons, I think right? so. He would talk about how generations of people have attempted to nail Robert Johnson's sound, and it being impossible, oh, yeah. and everyone loving it. So the guy, the guy was some type of acoustic genius. I would believe that. The um, the song that comes to mind for. Anyone who's intrigued um, in, in the Robert Johnson name and in that music, and anyone who might not be familiar with this one particular tune, is Preaching Blues, which has just the most incredible acoustics. And I, I wish we could play it now and, and kind of hear it. And you know, you, you just your mind would go in so many different directions because there's so much happening. There's this very percussive, you know, um, upbeat kind of thing that he's doing. At the same time, he's playing the whole thing with the slide, you know. So. Keep in mind, it's blues, and one of the greatest misconceptions is that blues is, you know, the downtrodden, down, you know, hearted, you know, aching, sadness, pain. It's really not, you know. I mean, if you listen to what we're talking about, albums, uh, sure. BB King's Indianola Mississippi Seeds album, I think that's like 19, gosh, I'm gonna butcher this, 81 maybe. But that is the most upbeat blues album I think I've ever heard in my life, and it's blues. It's BB King. I didn't come across yeah. that one. I should look at that Indianola, one. Indianola, Mississippi Seeds. Oh, yeah, cool. it's an incredible album. And just very upbeat. Uh, it starts off with a very beautiful kind of, you know, um, morbid kind of <laughs> tone to it. But that's just the intro. And then it just kicks off into this incredible, almost jam session of a thing. But anyway, to go back to that Robert Johnson tune, Preaching Blues or, in parentheses, uh, Up Jump the Devil. Very percussive, um, very rhythmic, and very, very fast, upbeat kind of. Um, tune that he's got going there, so I urge anyone who's listening to, to check that out. Nice. Yeah. Another fun coincidence I'll at least touch on is that when I was uh, I was chatting with him online before he came here, um, and as it turns out, what we, we both we both work uh, for what we're usually doing. We, we both work in the. Uh, design and building and architecture situations right so you're on the design side i'm on the building side there you go we're in the same uh, industry yeah I yeah mean, it, it's a it, it's a beautiful thing um i mean i i've been working for for a general contractor now for about 10 years and it's the last four and a half five years i want to say i've been really immersed out in the field i'm um, watching you know all the different components come together to build these buildings that really people or the general population has no idea <laughs> what it takes, you know, right. to, to create a building. I mean, it is just, it, it's so complex in so many different ways, you know, and the processes, the, the design is beyond me. I mean, that's a whole other process that I'll let you, you know, touch on, but it, it's really fascinating how much goes into building a building. Well, oh, there's a lot of it, and there's so, there's so many different specialties, you know, I was, just, just today, I was sending off info to the engineer that I'm working with, with the clients that I'm working with, for some very nice interior ornamental work for, for a resort not far from here. And, you know, it, it, it gets down to the nitty-gritty of, uh, you know, you're calculating how heavy something is by looking at the bar rates, and then you're, you're wondering about, should it be this ratio when you talk to the clients, and then, my gosh, you know, there's, I'm sure you deal with, like, plumbing penetrations to the oh, floors. <laughs> oh, yeah, and then, oh, yeah. And then the, you know, um, acoustics involved with that right and sound cocking and, and all yes. that kind of stuff i mean which just takes you to a whole another level I mean, well that, that that's connecting the two sides of it yeah see this is this is kind of this the where i'm i'm glad we're going here because this connection between the music and the space really fascinates me and there's a famous goethe johann wolfgang von goethe quote that architecture is frozen music right wow. and wow. And I, th and I think that's true, but then the question, the question is what kind of music is it? Is it music you want it to be? Is it music you like? And I think the places that people like, it tends to be. 
So now, we, you know, you, you're, you're really observing on the music, you're observing on the space. Is, is the acoustics something that you've worked with or observed or both? How does that work with what you've seen? Um, it, it's, uh, it's definitely some of the stuff that I've worked with. I'm not as close as my project manager or engineer, um, who's really involved in, in you know, the, the acousticians, you know, um, design and, and the whole process there. I'm more boots on the ground, kind of like the, the gritty, let's do what it, you know, takes That's to get right. it done, right? It's important. Um, so they, they'd be able to speak to it a lot more eloquently than I can. Sure. Um, but just the, you know, processes like, like sound uh, or bang testing, for lack of a better way to put it, but walking through a room, mm. you know, as it's still in stud framing and smacking on different areas, you know what I mean, to hear yes. the rattles and the buzzing, yeah. and then having to track that down and eliminate that rattle, that buzz, right? Sure. No, I, I know exactly what that is, because I've been, I've been involved in that kind of way on, way on the other side. The, the closest that I've gotten to that is when I worked for a company where part of what they did, they, they did design, but they also sold cladding. And some of what they did, it was amazing because my podcast, before I did the video stuff, I did a podcast that was audio only, uh, a history of architecture and stuff. But the, the audio quality just jammed up through the roof at a certain point, which you might, which people might notice or might not. The only difference, the oh, not a new microphone, not anything, the acoustic paneling, they had a demonstration room. And they, it's again, one of those things where people think it might be your imagination, sometimes, but no, not really. You could walk in there, and they. I, I told them they could do this for a demonstration. Play some, have some, play someone, have someone play a song that they like on your cell phone, and listen to it, and be like, okay, it sounds like that. Hit pause. Walk into that one room. Hit play. I, I am not kidding. It was like <laughs> the difference between plugging into a big stereo, because when you re, you talk about those corners and everything, right. you reduce those you reduce those reverberations. And it makes it makes all the difference. What what what, t what type of spaces were they were they testing for that? Were they like just, just like large meeting rooms? Or? Screening rooms actually. Oh, Theaters. fascinating. Yeah, yeah yep. there it's so, really important. Extremely important. That's great. Extremely important. So a lot, lot of um, again, like I said, just very you know it can get very complex, very intricate, and mm -hmm. more so on the install front, right? I mean, designing it is, is you know the craziness that it is on its own, but installing it. I mean, you got to yeah. have, you know, qualified individuals who are competent enough to install and not, you know, not people, a lot of what I want to, you know, I don't want to shame anything or, or generation or anything like that, but a lot of what you see between the, what's going out and what's coming in right now through the industry, I'd say is that, you know, there, there could be a sense of life outside of work. And that's more important almost to some mm. people than to people who knew that it was work is as important as, you know, Getting getting what you need to get done as accurately as efficiently as you can, mm -hmm. you know, to get on to your life right after work and you know that kind of thing. So it's just um, it's interesting to see how you know the world is changing in the sense of people's you know uh, craftsmanship, work ethic, and that kind of thing. From what I see, at least, you know, and I've, I haven't been around extremely long, but it's interesting to see you know the different processes people will take. And again, just craftsmanship is above all the most important thing. I'd say you know. It's, the dedication to your craft, right? I, I would agree. That's yeah. what that's what I that's what I attempt to live, you know. And I think one of the things I'm really optimistic about is for a long time in the late 19th century, and especially in the 20th century, and especially in the second half of the 20th century, and we're all familiar with it. We all live in the leftovers of this stuff. Is that you had industrial production? You had industrial production create this stuff that kind of felt like it sucked people's souls out because it was all the same. Uh, there was no sense of feeling. It was just about fast and cheap. Uh, and if you were using technology, you were taking it away from customization. Now, it's very, very different. Now, because of the subtlety that the computer stuff can bring. Uh, now, early on with computer stuff, it was kind of a bunch of nonsense. It was super clunky, and it still can use improvement, right? I mean, if, you, if you're using Revit, Revit's better than AutoCAD, but it's still clunky as heck. So they're going to, you know, I got ambitions about that to make the world better with software, but you're able, the main thing is that you're able to not get lost in the mechanics of it. You're able to, especially with parametric, what they call parametric or BIM software, where you set parameters instead of drawing each little column to say, okay, these columns are such and such distance apart at this size. 
these windows are all this class of window, and then instead of when you change your mind on something, you don't spend all this time like I used to, you gotta do your, it just click, it changes. And what that means is it frees up your time. For some people, it means it frees up your time to sell schlock, but I, <laughs> I try to not do that. Yeah. But I, you know, it frees up your time to think about, okay, what are the design choices right. that you work with a client, listen to your client, make it something they really love. That's more feasible now. And you're able to get this kind of stuff that has the sense of the hand touch to it because you've, you've drawn it. And then if you 3D print it and then cast mold it out of the 3D printing, oh man, we, we, we are just at the dawn of artisanship coming back. So I'm looking forward to all that. And you know, you brought up the... Um the history of, uh, of architecture. You said that was your previous podcast? Or previous video? podcast. I still I still do it on the video thing. Which, yeah, but yeah. I gotta say, I mean, my... The ultimate architecture, in my opinion, you know, and this is just my own limited experience, right? But I, I got to visit the Alhambra Palace in Granada. Oh, man. And yeah. the moment I walked in, it was just bizarre, just like... If it makes any sense, I felt like I lost my breath, you know. And and yeah. I looked around the room, and I just, I just thought, wow, th this feels like like a home, you know. And yes. It just felt like the most. I don't know. I, I don't really know how to put it in words, you know. It, it felt so, uh, just so so welcoming, you know. All of that architecture. I mean, just incredible, intricate patterns and designs, and you know, some of the uh, you know ceilings as you walk through the, the spaces are just. Breathtaking, you know. Um, have you? I'm surely, I'm sure that you know some of, of the Alhambra or the palace. I know of it. Yeah. I've never had the good fortune to go there, but I'm the reason. I, I don't mean to distract, and hopefully I'm not. The reason I'm frantically paging through this book. <laughs> by the way, this is the Nature of Order, Book One. Wow. Uh, Christopher Alexander's stuff. Uh, this is a guy I had the great fortune to work with, um, and he's really inspired a lot in terms of method about how do you achieve something that looks natural. Like, if, if anybody's heard of method acting, this is like method building, wow. where you try to think, it doesn't tell you what to do, but it gives you advice on how to, how to approach it so that you get something that's vibrant, get something that's living. But there's, there's pictures of the Alhambra in here. Uh, there's another mosque, uh, although the Alhambra is more of a citadel that has mosques in it. Right. Is that it? Yeah, because it's a bigger city. But I don't think I'll get lost paging through this, but uh, unless I can find it real quick. Yeah, the, Al the Alhambra is brilliant. And one of the things that Chris Alexander admired about it, which I also admire about it, is that you had each space in it was tuned to not just to itself, not just tuned to it. This is the frozen music thing. It was not just tuned to itself, but it was tuned to each other space. And, and so everything was put together. Puzzle piece isn't the right way to say it. It's more like a, more more like kernels in corn or grapes on a vine that have kind of grown together, right? Wow, what a beautiful way to put it. Man. Thank you. Yeah. But, but what was so? So you said it was. But you, you, the most important thing is kind of the feeling and, and the impression, the expression that you get there. And so for for, for people for people listening who are not maybe as familiar what was what was the some of the stuff about the way that it looked that or felt that really struck you oh man i mean j just it, it, like i said walking in it just took my breath away right i was, I was really just that might sound like a cliche but i don't know how else to put it i, I was just a, at a loss of words and this is the trip that i went on alone um and walking through the space was phenomenal i mean i didn't know what to think and as i you know gathered my footsteps through the place I'm looking around, I start to realize, I go, man, this is all handcrafted, you know, I mean, all handcrafted, you know, just hand, hand carved, beautiful um, lettering, I mean, j just throughout the place, very incredible, and like you said, you touched a little bit on, on you know, the, the um, sound, or sound architecture, it's, it's kind of what it was, right, something like that, so it really is these spaces that when you walk through, you feel like you can almost hear people breathing from across the room and or, maybe or, or in adjacent rooms and maybe you could I mean I, I was just so my mind was going a million different directions as I'm walking through so I wouldn't yeah. doubt if it's true but that's just what I, what I, I experienced I can tell you how I can tell you how and why that would be true 
and that would be with uh, with ellipsoid or hemispherical spaces. If you have something that's an apsoidal end, which I know exists in there somewhere, and there's there's probably cupolas and domes wow. in many different places. Uh, there's uh, there's a phenomenon that happened like this that they did not on purpose in the capital in D.C. The place that was the original. It's now. Uh, Statuary Hall. They just use it for statues. It's, tourists go there. It's a nice place, but it used to be the old House of Representatives chambers. And they moved out of it because it was too echoey. It was a little bit weird. But one thing that John Quincy Adams was famous for doing is he pretended he was asleep and would sit in a place knowing that he'd be able to hear what other congressmen were whispering to each other if they, right? But that, it's a real thing. It happens. But when I, I don't doubt, I do not doubt that the genius. Um, you know, Andalusian stonemasons in, um, in in the Alhambra. They pr they probably understood how that worked and did it on purpose. Uh, the Greeks definitely did it on purpose. That's how they did their amphitheaters. Um, and uh, people debate as to whether Stonehenge did it on purpose or not, because that has weird echoing stuff that happens. But you know, no, that's that's amazing that you were able to to notice that. Yeah. What, what do you think about, um, is there another, uh, any, any, any tune that comes to mind or something? You know, we were talking about Robert Johnson and I, I've, yeah. been, I've had this on my fingertips since. This tune is called uh, Terraplane Blues by Robert Johnson. And I forgot to mention, for anyone who's, who's watching, who's tuning in here, uh, the tuning of this guitar right now is open G. Right? G is in uh, great, let's say. Okay. And I love it. I, I call it the greatest tuning because it's just, I, I can't see myself tuning out of it too much. It's very melodic. So it's D, G, D, G, B, D. And it almost plays itself, so you can do things like... This tune is called uh, Terraplane Blues. It's a Robert Johnson tune. This is my interpretation of it. Excellent.
well, as those tubes get hotter there, what happens is it starts to expand. Right. right. So the sound really starts to open up, and there's different features on that. So I think right now it might be on diodes is the first switch it's facing down. It might say diodes instead of tubes. Let's see. The last one might say bright instead of warm. That's some diodes. Yeah. Tubes stand by diodes. Yeah. So yeah. What, yeah, that's what, what's the difference between the tubes and the diodes? So, you, you know, I wouldn't be able to, to really speak to it, to be honest with you. Um, I, I kind of just feel it through as it warms up. That's right. When I start playing, I go, I'm going to go through the bottom and, and wait till, you know, wait till it gets really warm and I can flip up to the tube and see what that sounds like. So, oh, I start off on the diodes usually and then go up to the tube and they expand. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one, of the, you know, one of the beautiful things about the, the analog stuff is that when it's, uh, when it's right in front of your fingertips like that, it, it doesn't matter to, to understand how it works, you just understand to perceive what it does. Oh, absolutely. That's, that's the best thing. Absolutely. Well, if people are curious about, I'm probably going to put a link in the description and everything, for anybody uh, listening here who wants to find out more about your stuff and uh, what you do, where should, where should they find you? Absolutely, yeah. So on, on the Instagram, it's uh, at official uh, dot William Fox, I believe. Uh, right. And that's, you know, that's where you can see where I'm playing next and that kind of thing. Again, it's not, you know, what I do as a full-time. It's a, it's a musician's page there. Um, but what I do in the full-time is uh, I'm an assistant superintendent for a general contractor. Um, but yeah, this is what... This is really what I love to do in the off hours, right? That apparently makes us blenders too. I made these for myself, so yeah, little little crafts and hobbies that I have on the Amazing. side. Yeah, yeah, it's been, it's been fun. Fantastic. Well, we can either we, we, we could either wrap it up. It's a good time, 37 minutes, or up to you. We can wrap it up, or you can play one more. Yeah. No, let's do let's do one more, and then we'll wrap it up. How's that? Sound? Fantastic. All right. Perfect. 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 Go ahead. I'm gonna tune down uh, for this one, so we're gonna tune over to open D. I'm gonna tune up, I believe. Open D to A. Uh -huh. D A D F sharp A D.
Thank you, David. I appreciate you, uh, you know, inviting me on. Yeah, thank you so much. So this has been fantastic, and uh, thank you, every everyone, for listening. And also, great thanks to Arroyo Outdoor Tiles Pots. We got our summer sale, twenty percent off, of course, if you're in the area. But all right. And thanks to the Pasadena, uh, South, pa South Pasadena uh, Farmer's Market. It's always great to be here every Thursday, 4 to 8. But uh, thank you so much. Thank you, David. Thank you, guys.